You are enough. This is the mantra of modern times, isn't it? It is the heart song of the self. It's the mantra and song that's in the bloodstream of culture all around us, isn't it? Think about this past month or this past week or even last couple days in your life. How many times did you hear something like that? You are enough. This is truly the message in the Western air that we breathe, isn't it? But why? Why is this the mantra? Why is this the heart song? Well, because at the end of the day, deep, deep down, we believe that we're self made self-sufficient, that we can self-help, self-strengthen, self-comfort, and be self-keepers of our own destiny. And nothing makes this more abundantly clear than the booming self-help industry here in the West. That industry pulls in over $13 billion a year here in the States, and it's climbing. The number is climbing. And that's stunning, isn't it? The number shows us that we, we believe that we are in of ourselves, after reading some books and hearing some TED Talks, we believe that we're sufficient, fully capable of self-strengthening ourselves on the journey through this life. But on our own, are we sufficient? Are we enough? Well, please open your Bible to the book of Ephesians. This morning, we're going to be continuing our series through this letter. We're going to be looking specifically at Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verses 14 through 21 today. Uh, if you are new to reading the Bible, uh, there are, there's one in the pew near you. You can find Ephesians chapter 3 on page 977. 977. Uh, and if, again, if you're new to reading the Bible, the large uh, numbers are the chapter numbers, the small numbers are the verse numbers. And we're going to all be helped to keep our Bibles open to this passage this morning. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. Please follow along as I read. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God." Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's say that together. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, I have nothing extraordinary to say this morning, but you do. And we ask now that you would speak to us through your living and active word. Lord, we pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that you would renew our minds to behold the glory of Christ. Lord, we ask that you would do what you alone can do, that you would root us and ground us and grow us in strength to comprehend your love in Christ toward us. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, in Ephesians thus far, in chapters 1 
and 2 to the first half of chapter 3, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has caused us to see by pure grace that God has done the seemingly impossible, that he has made the dead in sin alive in Christ, that he has adopted hell-bound spiritual orphans into his family, And that by pure grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, he has called us sons and daughters in Christ Jesus. He has raised us up in him, and he has seated us with him in the heavenly places, in the already and the not yet. He has reconciled sinners to himself vertically. He has reconciled us to one another in the church, horizontally, in Christ. God has done the seemingly impossible. He has taken Jew and Gentile, Republican and Democrat, slave and free, educated and non-educated, men and women from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And through the gospel, he has formed and is forming a new people, a temple, a new humanity in Christ to display his manifold wisdom to the world and to the heavenlies. We have seen all of this in chapter 1 through the first part of chapter 3. And beloved, what was impossible for us to do on our own, God has made possible through Christ. What we were unable to do on our own, God has proven himself able to do through Christ Jesus our Lord. And as we discovered last week, in light of all that God has done, Paul began to pray. But he, he got interrupted. He interrupted himself. He got caught up in the glory and the beauty and the mystery that we don't have to be an ethnic child of Abraham to be a part of God's people. No, instead, all we must be is in Christ to be saved. Well, here in our passage this morning, Paul finishes what he started back in chapter 3, verse 1. And with boldness, And with access, with confidence, as he says in chapter 3, verse 12, Paul goes before the throne of grace, and he prays for the church. And he prays for God to do what he alone can do for his people, then and now. And to whom he prays, and how he prays, and what he prays, should shape the way that we pray for the church. And so, if you're taking notes this morning, here's the big idea of Paul's prayer. Here's the outline for our time together. Here it is. Our God is able to fill us with the strength to comprehend the love of Christ. Our God is able to fill us with the strength to comprehend the love of Christ. And in light of that main point, Paul's going to main point here in this prayer, we're going to look at our God in verses 14 through 15. Then we're going to look at our prayer in verses 16 to 19. And then we're going to look at our confidence in verses 20 to 21. Our God, our prayer, our confidence. So let's get going. Point one, our God Well, after plumbing the depths of God's glorious work and revealing the mystery of the gospel, he writes, verse 14, look there with me, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Let's stop there for a moment. Beloved, with humility, both in word and in posture, Paul goes before God, the Father, in prayer. And he prays to God, who is, verse 15, not just a father, but the father of his family. And scholars agree that that word every is better translated whole. And who is God's whole family? Well, in the context of this letter, it is all who are called saints and faithful in Christ Jesus, as Paul set up in chapter 1, verse 1. All of us who have been adopted In Christ, as Paul declared in Ephesians chapter 2, all of God's children in heaven, those who have gone before us now, who have died in Christ 
and His children on earth, we who are in Christ in the here and now. And beloved, God is community. He is family. He is Trinity, right? He is Father, Son, and Spirit. We see this clearly in the language of this prayer. We see the Father and the Son and the Spirit. They all get airtime in this prayer. And our triune God, before the foundation of the earth, as we read in chapter 2, has set apart and called out of the brothel of this world His children. He's called out those who belong to Him. He has bought us through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, and He has brought us through the gospel into His spiritual family. And He is, He is our true and better Father, globally and locally. And do you know what this means, beloved? This means that if you're out and about, and you're at a restaurant, for instance, and you find out that there's a believer sitting near you, at the table near you, or as you're waiting to be seated, this means that you have more in common with that believer in Christ than anyone else in that place that's not a Christian. They're your family. It also means that if you're on an airplane and you sit next to a Spanish-speaking person from Mexico that's a Christian, or you sit next to a modern Hebrew-speaking Israeli that's a Christian, or you speak, or you sit next to an Arabic-speaking Palestinian that's a Christian, or you sit next to a French-speaking person from Canada that's a Christian. Oh, if they are Christians, beloved, then you have more in common with that person in Christ than your own neighbors, your own family members that do not have an ongoing relationship with Jesus. Beloved, here's the point. In Christ, we are part of a family, a better family, globally and locally. We are members of His household, and God has made the impossible possible through the gospel in places like Ephesus and in places like Hillsborough. And He has formed and is forming a new humanity a new family, and He is our true and better Father, and He loves to give good gifts to His children, like power and strength and knowledge to comprehend the incomprehensible in Christ by the work of the Spirit. And here's the beautiful thing. Before we walk through Paul's prayer, this is very important. If you are a Christian here in this room today, then God has already given you Himself. He's already given you His Son. And therefore, He has given us all that we need as His family to live and to spiritually grow in strength and knowledge of Him, His provision, His grace, and His love. And so, like Paul, we who are not enough can pray with dependence and confidence, and humility to our God and Father who is enough. Well, in light of this prayer, we should be asking, what what do we specifically pray for? What should we specifically pray for? And that brings us to point two, our prayer. Look with me at verses 16 through 19. Paul prays at the church according to the riches of His glory, that He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This will be my longest point this morning, beloved. Here we read Paul's prayer for the church of Ephesus, but he also, we also read here of Paul's prayer for the church here in Hillsborough, for Hillsborough First Baptist Church, more specifically. And before we look at the specific petitions in this prayer, let's first notice what Paul does not pray for. He doesn't pray for himself, for his own wants and needs. He doesn't pray for the church's physical health. He doesn't pray for financial blessing for the church. 
He doesn't pray that we as a church would have all the right staff and programs and the means to do all the right things in order to have transient prom- prominence and glory here in Hillsboro. He doesn't pray that we would keep it all together with our own strength and wisdom and power or gifting. No. Now, he could have prayed for some of those things, and some of those things are, are worthy to be prayed for. But he doesn't. And this is so instructive for us, beloved. What does Paul pray for? Well, he, when he prays for the church, he prays for the spiritual health of the church. That is what he is most concerned with. And he prays for God to do in us what he alone can do because we are not enough on our own. We don't have the strength or power on our own. And so Paul prays that God would fill his people, that fill the church then and now. And according to the riches of his glory, with spirit-given and spirit-driven strength and power to comprehend what we can't on our own, and that is the limitless love of Christ. And this should be our prayer to our God for our church, beloved. So let's walk through some of the details and the petitions or requests in this prayer. First, beloved, the riches that Paul speaks of there in verse 16 are the immeasurable and abundant riches of his glory. He's spoken of these riches time and time again throughout this letter already. These riches include his strength and his might, his wisdom, his blessing and love in Christ. These are not uh, monetary riches to be doled out to those who are strong enough or uh, are strong enough to help themselves. And side note, that statement that God only helps those who help themselves, it's unbiblical. It's garbage. No, no, these are the eternal riches of blessing and salvation found in Christ and in His Word. And we are 100% dependent upon God to receive these riches from Him. We are 100% dependent upon the Spirit to fill us with the riches of God's strength and power in our, as Paul says, inner being. See, Paul is praying for us to be dependent, not independent. He is praying that we would find strength and identity not in the cult of self or in expressive individualism or in our inner feelings. He prays that the church would look outside itself to God for strength and power. He calls us to look to the Spirit to strengthen and renew our inner being, which is our heart, the core, the nucleus of our being. Paul prays that because he knows that God alone is capable to do this, oh, he prays that we who are not enough, he prays that God who is enough would do the work that only he can do. Looking at verse 17 here, Paul prays that Christ would dwell in our inner being, in our hearts. He is not praying for us to ask Jesus into our heart over and over and over again. No, he is praying for the church, those who already have Christ dwelling in them. But he is praying that second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, that Christ would dwell and further be formed in us, that we would be more and more filled with Him and His presence, and that by the work of the Spirit that we would grow in Christ-likeness with hearts filled more and more with Christ. And he prays this for the church because Paul knew the human heart. Paul knew the human heart. He himself had one. He knew that we look to the things of this world to fill our hearts He knew, and he knows that our hearts, our inner beings are like bowls that are always being filled with worldly pursuits or news or social media or politics or social anxieties or worries about tomorrow. He he knows that our hearts have the potential to be filled with idols that promise much but underdeliver. And Paul knows that on our own, because of our sin, we like it that way because our hearts are deceitful. And we like to follow our hearts because we want what we want, when we want it, how we want it, why we want it, on the terms of our own hearts. But Paul is praying here that we would not follow our hearts, but that we would follow Christ. And that our inner being would be filled 
with something better. That our hearts would be filled with Christ. That our hearts would be the dwelling place of Christ by faith. And how does Christ come to dwell in us and continue to dwell in us? Well, it is through the truth of the gospel. It is through the work and truth of the gospel, that truth that Christ set aside his splendor. He left his father's side, that he took on a robe of frail humanity, and that he entered the world, that he came in love and lived the life that we couldn't, blamelessly and sinlessly. And then he went and died the death that we deserved on the cross. That's not the end. For three days later, he rose up in power and glory over sin and death, in victory over sin and death. And beloved, he did this so that you and I might have Christ dwell in our hearts by the work of the Spirit and make us part of God's spiritual family, a work that he alone can do by grace, through faith in Christ alone. Friends, this is the gospel. This is the good news and message that we never get over. This is the good news for all who have been blessed and chosen and predestined and adopted and redeemed and forgiven and united and saved and sealed and strengthened in Christ by the power of the Spirit. And we who have been called, saved through this gospel, hold the promise of eternal life with Christ forevermore. And there's only one response to this good news then, that's repentance and faith. Repentance turning away from sin, turning away from the false gospel that we are enough, and turning toward Christ by faith alone for salvation. If you have questions about this, I'll be standing in the back after the service. I would love nothing more than to talk with you. Or you can talk with someone in the pew near you who is smiling as I was sharing the good news of the gospel. We would love to talk with you about Jesus. Nothing more. Nothing more than to talk with you about Jesus. But beloved, if you are living a life of ongoing repentance and belief in Christ, then you have been bought into and brought into a spiritual family. Your heart of stone has been replaced with a heart of flesh, and you have been given a new inner being. Amen? Amen. And get this. You are not only in Christ then, but Christ is in you by the work of the Spirit. And this means, beloved, that Christ has made his home in your heart once and for all, and nothing can change that. And as the Spirit continues to work in you, Christ is being formed in you and me by grace. All because of the gospel. Well, pressing further into the second half of verse 18, Paul prays in light of the truth of the gospel that we would be rooted and grounded in love. And we should be asking, why, why two verbs, Paul? Why rooted and grounded? Well, to be rooted in love is to be firmly planted, deeply rooted in not just any love, but God's love. And to be grounded in love is to be firmly set, not simply upon the foundation, but in the foundation of love, of God's love. And so Paul wants this to be completely clear in our hearts and minds, that to have Christ dwell in us is to be filled with the perfect, unceasing, unwavering, rooting, and grounding love of God. This is that transcendent, higher love, that that one song was talking about. This is far beyond that. And Paul tells us three truths about this love of Christ. He tells us that it's all-encompassing, that it is all-surpassing, and that it is all-consuming. First, we read here that the love of Christ is all-encompassing. This is what we see in verse 18. I'm not sure how you describe God's love, but know this. It is bigger and greater and more beautiful than you could possibly imagine. I mean, it's so magnified and glorious and omnidirectional and and multidimensional here that Paul speaks of it in boundless terms, in limitless terms. For it is a love that is and has more, more breadth and length and more height and more depth than we could even grasp. 
And Paul knows that we're unable to grasp this love on our own. And so he prays that God would do what he alone can do. He prays that the Spirit of God would give us spiritual strength, supernatural strength to comprehend the all-encompassing love of Christ. Well, second, we read here that the love of Christ is all-surpassing. We read of this in the first half of verse 19. Now, how in the world can we know the unknowable? Something that surpasses our knowledge. Well, we naturally, again, we can't. But here's the connection between this prayer and Paul's earlier prayer back in Ephesians chapter 1. Within that prayer, Paul prayed that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened. Do you remember that? See, we are unable to know all of this, this incomprehensible love of God on our own, but God is able. And so we are solely dependent upon Him to supernaturally open the eyes of our hearts to comprehend the incomprehensible love of Christ. Beloved, He must do this work in our lives, in our family members' lives, in our friends' and neighbors' lives, in the life of our church. For only the Spirit can reveal the all-surpassing love of Christ to us. And that ought to change and shape the way that we pray. Well, we've seen that the love of Christ is all-encompassing and all-surpassing. But third, it is also all-consuming. We read of this in the second part of verse 18. And, and you know, it's pretty incredible. This is a little side note here. This is a little freebie here. Uh, 30% of the words of Ephesians... Are, are also written to the letter to the Colossians. And Paul's letter to the Colossians, and in that letter, we read that in him, that is Christ, the whole fullness of the deity of God dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him. Can we just stop and think about that just for a moment? The fullness of God dwells in Christ, and this means that if Christ dwells in our hearts, this means the fullness of God, verse 19, dwells in us. The infinite dwells within the finite. Wow. What a jaw-dropping truth that is. That's amazing. And this is all because of God's love in Christ that is all-encompassing, all-surpassing, and all-consuming. And where do we see this love most clearly? Where do we see the love of God in Christ most clearly? Well, we see it in the cross of Christ, the place where God has displayed that he is definitely, infinitely, and intimately for us. And that he definitely, infinitely, and intimately loves us. Not because we are so lovely, but because Christ is not because we're enough on our own, but because Christ is enough. Well, there are four words that we have barely touched on within this prayer, and those four words are in verse 18. I don't know if you noticed that I kind of walked right past them for a moment there, and that's with all the saints, those four words. This prayer is not simply for individual Christians. It's not an individual Christian prayer that we would be renewed and conformed and given strength to comprehend the incomprehensible love of God in Christ, though we certainly can pray that for ourselves. But Paul's prayer, Paul prays this, for the church global and local, and we cannot miss this, Christ doesn't just fill a people individually with his love through the gospel, but he aims to fill a people, the church, collectively with his love in and through the gospel. And as the Spirit presses that gospel love deeper and deeper into our hearts, into all the saints in the local church, what happens? Well, a gospel culture that is marked by the love of Christ forms in the life of the church. And so what does a gospel culture marked by the love of Christ look like here at Hillsborough First Baptist Church. Taking this to the pavement of our lives, it looks like pursuing the love of Christ in our life together. Pursuing the love of Christ in our life together. 
You know, it is possible for us to be informed by God's love and not be transformed by it. It is possible to be familiar with God's love and actually not truly know it. And so in a world filled with fallen and human and natural love, love that is based on preference or lust of the flesh or self-centeredness, in a world full of this kind of love, we ought to, with the Lord's help, pursue sacrificial, Christ-given, others-centered, higher and compelling love. The kind of love that Paul is talking about here, he's going to flesh out in the next three chapters of Ephesians. Now, beloved, we may not be able to exhaustively and, and completely comprehend this love, but we can truly know this love because we have God's Word, which is a love letter. And we have God's gospel, which is a work of love. And we have God's people here at HFBC, a people marked by love. And so open your Bible and read of the love of Christ. Look at the life and death and resurrection of Jesus and rest in God's love. And then look at our church family, the place where the love of God is revealed. You know, we love because Christ first loved us. And so let's pursue the love of Christ in our life together in the way that we prefer one another and speak to one another and listen to one another and seek the very best for one another. Let's pursue the love of Christ in our life together. And second, let's pray. Let's pray that the love of Christ would grow amongst us in our life together. Beloved, how do you pray for the church? Getting really practical here. How do you pray for the church? What is your prayer for the church today? Most often we pray for physical or practical needs. But how often do you, do you pray for the spiritual needs of HFBC? Let me encourage us. We have a new member prayer directory being released today. Thanks, Meeks, for passing those out. Let me encourage you to grab one of those and then read back through this prayer in the coming weeks and just pray the words of this prayer. Pray with Paul over each and every member of Hillsborough First Baptist Church and then pray these words for yourself. Pray Paul's spirit-inspired words of this prayer over the members here at HFBC. And let's, and let's pray to the end of being filled with the love of Christ more and more. Well, here's a summary, uh, really a summary statement here of kind of what's been going on in this prayer. Our prayer ought to be that our God who is able would fill us with strength to comprehend the love of Christ for our joy and His glory. Now, you may be thinking to yourself at this point, um, Chris, I've been a Christian for a while. I've been a part of the church for a while. This kind of knowledge of God's love seems beyond me. It seems quite beyond us. This kind of gospel culture that you're talking about, that seems impossible. I mean, I trust that Christ dwells in me and, and dwells in us. I, I pray and I read my Bible, but I often don't feel the love of God. I often don't feel this kind of spiritual strength and awareness of the love of Christ. And so all of this feels and seems really unattainable. I don't feel confident that God can do any of this. Well, dear Christian, if you have thought any of this, you are in good company. You're in good company. Because the good news of Christ's work in us, and this is what we need to remember, is not based upon our feelings. It's not based upon our maturity. It's not based upon the tenacity or the strength of our faith. It's not even based upon our doubts. It's not based on us at all. The good news of Christ's work in us is based in Christ alone, objectively and finally and definitely. Because we're not enough, but God is enough. And when we are weak, 
he is strong. And therefore, we can be confident, not in ourselves, but in him, that he hears our prayers and will answer our prayers. Why? Because he's able to do far more than we ask or think. Far more. And that brings us to point three, our confidence. Look with me at verses 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the prayer at work with, uh, power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Here, Paul moves from praise, from Paul, from he prays, and then he moves to praise of God for who he is, to doxology. And when we, when we say that God is able, when Paul declares that God is able, what, what we're saying is that he has the power to do what he says he will do. That his speaking is his doing. And because of this, he is worthy of our confidence. And in the light of the reality at the climax of this prayer, Paul offers this benediction, this blessing, this doxology of praise, much like the ones that we hear at the end of every service each Lord's Day here at HFBC. Here, Paul triumphantly praises God for his ability to do far more than we can comprehend. And he prays that his power would fill the church. Do you notice that? The, the home, the family of God. And, and power is, is really interesting, isn't it? It's so desired and is so often misused. I mean, there's a reason that one of the greatest theologians of all time, Spider-Man's grandpa, said that with great power comes great responsibility. He understood that power attained is easily misused. So how should we think about God's power biblically, particularly His power that resides in us? Well, we should link God's power with prayer and with the church, as Paul does here. That's what we see here in verse 20. Here Paul challenges our understanding of power by pointing us to the source of true power that resides in the church. And compared to Ephesus, which was a powerful city with powerful leaders, with a powerful goddess named Artemis and a powerful ruler named Caesar, in a world where, where power was everything, here Paul is pointing us to a better power, God's power. And this power really is the bookends of this prayer. Did you, did you notice this? The nerdy word for this is inclusio. Did you notice that we see God's power in verse 16, and then we see God's power here in verse 20. The whole prayer is a power sandwich. And Paul is making it abundantly clear that we can do nothing without the power of God. We aren't enough, but He is, and our prayers will be powerless without His power. For just as Jesus says in John 15, apart from Him, we can do what? Nothing. And so, picking up on that truth, the words of Christ Himself, Paul says here that where we are unable, God is able, and where we are powerless, God is powerful. And he's not just powerful and empowered to do some things. No, he is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. And that ought to fill us with confidence, not in ourselves, but in God. So, beloved, what, what do weak Christians need to hear? What do weary Christians need to hear? What do wounded Christians need to hear? Well, we need to be reminded. We need to hear that God is able, more than able, to accomplish anything or any of our concerns. And He is worthy of our dependence, and we express our dependence upon Him in the way that we pray. Now, I want to address a, a brief elephant in, just briefly, an elephant in the room, and maybe an elephant in your heart and mind right now as we read this. I know that many of our prayers seemingly go unanswered, whether it's a prayer for the church or a job or a need or a family member to be saved or someone to be healed. I know what it's like to pray, and it seems like that prayer is not heard. But if we are God's children, 
part of his family, by grace, through faith in Jesus, then the truth of ask and you will receive will always be true. And what we receive is always best for us according to God's will, according to his timing, even when it doesn't seem best to us. Many things in this life are certain, and this is one of them. And we can be confident of this. And so when things seem impossible or unattainable, when you're feeling spiritually weak, let's run to our Father boldly and confidently, knowing that He knows what we need before we ask it of Him. Let's run to Him with our prayers and our praises and our petitions. Let's continue doing that week after week as we gather together, as we pray together. Let's run to Him with our prayers and praises and petitions together, knowing that the love of Christ and His power that are beyond our comprehension are verse 20. According to verse 20, at work within us by the Spirit. Beloved, if you are indeed a Christian, God's love and power is at work in us. And that means that the same power that created all things, the same power that brings the spiritually dead to life, the same power that spoke these words through the hand of Paul to the church, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, is at work in us. And that is good news for our church as we are in revitalization. That is good news for us as we, with the Lord's help, continue to look to being centered on God's Word and on His gospel, as we continue to be committed to God's Word and the power of the gospel and to meaningful membership and relationships here in the life of the church and unity in our life together. Beloved, we are unable to do this on our own. We are not enough. But God is able. He is enough. He is our confidence. And he can do far more abundantly than what we ask or think. Well, we should close. This prayer finds itself at a transitional moment in the letter. Uh, It really functions like a door on a hinge, uh, opening into the next part of the letter. As we've seen in chapters 1 through 3, the spirit of the hand of Paul, we've seen and read of rich gospel doctrine. But Paul is about to move us under the inspiration of the spirit into gospel devotion in chapters 4 through 6. Paul is about to move us from doctrine to devotion, from what's, what's called indicative to imperative, and from knowledge of the love of Christ to practicing the love of Christ together. And though what Paul has said and has prayed in this letter thus far may seem impossible, everything and anything is possible with God. And though we are unable on our own, we aren't strong enough on our own, we aren't enough on our own, God is enough. And He is able to strengthen us and sustain us and to fill us with the love of Christ. Amen? All, for as it says there in verse 21, all for His glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray that You alone would do what You alone can do, that You would dwell in our hearts richly, that your word would dwell in our hearts richly, that the gospel would dwell in us richly, and that we would live out your word and gospel in our life together. Lord, we know that we are not enough to accomplish this task, but we know that you are enough, as we've seen even in this prayer. You are able. And so, Lord, we pray that you alone would do what you alone can do for our good and for your 
glory as we look to the day of Christ's return. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.